What makes more power on a B16A VTEC Honda? A Turbonetics Turbo, a Jackson Racing Roots Supercharger, or a Vortec Centrifugal Supercharger? Quick, let's head to the chassis dyno. Wah, wah. Hello everybody, I'm Richard Oldner and welcome to the channel. What is your favorite form of forced induction? Do you like roots blowers? Do you like centrifugal blowers? Or do you like turbos? What if I compared all three on the same motor to show you what the boost curves look like and then what the power curves look like? Let's go. Okay, guys, let's take a look at a comparison I did on a B16 Honda. This one was a Del Sol, an original SI that had this motor stock. And what I did was, as I talked about in the introduction, we ran a B16A basically stock. We ran it with Honda programming so that we could control the air, fuel, and timing, make it even for all of our competitors here. We ran the, the motor NA with an apex header and an air intake, kind of the way that lots of guys do in the Hondas. And then we ran it with three different forms of forced induction. We ran a Jackson Racing Supercharger. We ran a Vortec Supercharger. And then we ran a Turbonetics Turbo on this combination. And we ran them all as close as we could get to the same boost. And we're going to go over the boost curves and show you exactly what the differences are. But really kind of what I want to show you is what happens with each one of them. What kind of power curves they produce. What kind of boost curves they produce. So you guys can kind of pick and see which one you like because they're definitely different. But let's jump right in. This is our B6. A 1.6 liter twin cam VTEC motor. We ran it, as I said, essentially stock. It had stock cam, stock intake manifold. It had, it did have an apex header and it had apex, apexy. You guys can tell me how to pronounce that correctly. We use this header on a lot of stuff, but a long tube header, uh, kind of an open exhaust. We had a, a, a a B pipe, we call it after that with a, you know, it's kind of a straight through muffler. So it had a, a good free flowing exhaust system. Not that this thing really needed it. I mean, it wasn't making a ton of power NA because it was otherwise stock. It had the, uh, uh, an RS Akimoto air intake just to, you know, filter on a stick kind of thing with a radius entry on it. And so that we had that uh, aimed up on the chassis dyno and all this testing was done on the chassis dyno. So unlike a lot of my videos where we run it on the engine dyno, this actually shows the response rate of, for instance, the turbo, and we can see these other superchargers. And we ran it all the way from 2,000 RPM out to 8,000 RPM. So you get a big spread. Again, we're going to point out, not that you would ever be doing roll-ons or be doing acceleration runs starting at 2,000 RPM, but it kind of shows you what's going on with the boost response, which is always good for the turbo guy. So let's jump right in. And this is our naturally aspirated combination. We are going to take a look at both horsepower and torque on here. There right now I've added the torque curve. You can kind of see the torque curve is in red and the horsepower curve is in blue. And you can see this combination with the header and air intake, our naturally aspirated B16 made 146 horsepower at the tire and 111 foot-pounds of torque. We can see right here our VTEC actuation point between 5,000 and 5,500, right at around 5,200. So this is the NA power curve. So let's jump right in and see what happens when we added our Jackson Racing Supercharger. Here's what happened on our Jackson Racing Supercharger. And we ran a pulley so that this thing would get as close to seven pounds as we could. We had a limited number of pulleys. And unfortunately, we didn't get quite to seven pounds on this, except at the very, very, at the at the power peak, basically. But the Jackson Racing Supercharger produced right at 200 horsepower. And peak torque was pushed up to 134 foot-pounds. Yeah, 134 foot-pounds of torque. You can see it made more power everywhere as we kind of expect. It's also important to note that on the Jackson Racing Supercharger, it gets rid of the factory P30 you know, B16 intake manifold. So it gets rid of all that runner length and replaces that with the blower and then a very, very short runner intake manifold. And that's part of the reason that we see the shaped power curve the way that it is. You can see it's it's making peak power all the way out at our peak engine speed of, we ran this one to 8,100 RPM. Short runners will help it do that. But now let's take a look at the Vortec supercharger. We we'll Take a look at what happens when we added the Jackson Racing supercharger to our B16A Honda. Now let's take a look and see what happened when we added a centrifugal Vortex supercharger. And the two kits are 
different in that the Jackson Racing Supercharger for one is a positive displacement supercharger, so it's a roots blower. The Vortec has a centrifugal supercharger, and the difference basically is that a centrifugal supercharger, it tends to be more efficient at every pound of boost that it makes compared to a roots blower, but it does not have immediate boost response. So they do very well at the top end of the power peak where they have lots of RPM. It basically, it is a crank driven super or turbocharger if you will so it has a smaller impeller it has to spin very fast in order to process the air and make the boost and we'll see exactly that the other differences is are the jackson racing supercharger kit did not come with any type of intercooler it had a dedicated intake casting short runner that it mounted the blower to but there was no intercooler incorporated into that the vortex supercharger utilized the factory b16 intake manifold and then also included an air to water intercooler in the mix. So even though we were only running seven pounds, all of this was run on a combination of 91 pump gas and 100 octane race gas so that we could run the same timing whether it was intercooled or non-intercooled. The Vortec did benefit from having an intercooler and probably a slightly more efficient supercharger. But let's take a look and see what happened when we added the Vortec to our B16. This is our naturally aspirated deal, 146 horsepower and 111 foot-pounds of torque. Here's what happened when we added the Vortec with a pulley to try to get this thing to make as close as we could to seven pounds of boost. And on the Vortec, it doesn't make seven pounds until the very maximum engine speed, basically 8,000 or 8,100 RPM. In this case, run with the Vortec Supercharger, it made quite a bit more power than it did with the Jackson Racing. It made 230 horsepower and peak torque checked in about 150 foot-pounds of torque. And peak torque happened way out at the top of the RPM range. As you can see, it didn't really offer big power gains until we really started getting going. And then out of the top, it kind of charged hard from, you know, let's say 5,500 or 6,000 out to 8,000 RPM. So Jerfical Superchargers do very well at higher engine speeds where the the roots blowers tend to do better down at low engine speeds. Now we've taken a look at what happens when we added the Vortex supercharger. Let's find out what happens when we add a turbo. Okay, we've taken a look at the two blowers, the Jackson Racing Roots blower and the Vortex Centrifugal Super Supercharger. Now let's take a look at what happened when we added a Turbonetics turbo kit for it. This is our naturally aspirated combination, 146 horsepower, 111 foot-pounds of torque. Here's what happened when we added our Turbonetics turbo. Seven pounds of boost, you can see pretty good power gains. In fact, we made the most torque and not quite the most peak horsepower. We're gonna talk about that. We'll take a look at the boost curves and stuff. But equipped with the turbo at or near seven pounds of boost. Again, we couldn't get it exactly, but 217 horsepower. Peak torque was 100 and let's see. 158 foot pounds of torque so it did really well and you can see it comes up and you know we got a pretty good boost response we'll be able to see that on the boost curves when i show you that but the little turbo next turbo this was a, a small t3 turbo it had uh, unlike the vortex which had an air to water intercooler the turbo next turbo had an air to air intercooler on the front we made sure to have a fan blowing on this during the testing again all of this stuff was tuned to using Honda data which would made life kind of very very simple and again we had enough timing in the, the air fuel these are all run at about 11 7 11 8 on the air fuel and uh we ran these all on 91 and 100 but now let's take a look at the differences in the boost curves and we can kind of compare these in the power curves as well you guys can see what the difference is between the different forms a force induction. Now let's take a look at the three forms of force induction. We got the Jackson Racing Roots Supercharger positive displacement. We have the Vortex Centrifugal Supercharger, and then we have the Turbo. So we're starting out with the Jackson, Jackson Racing positive displacement Roots Supercharger. This is the boost curve supplied by this on our B16. You can see down here at 2100 RPM started out at about three pounds of boost rose up to six and a half pounds here at 5200 or so and then when the VTEC actuated it had kind of a slower climb and a lot of people are thinking well yeah that's because you have overlap and all the boost is bleeding out that's not actually not what's happening what's happening is now the motor has gotten much more efficient on the VTEC or secondary cam profile and so the supercharger is actually having a harder time keeping up with the amount of airflow that it has in in relation to engine speed 
speed. And so the VE of the motor has gotten better. So what happens is you have a slower rise in boost offered by the supercharger than you did on the primary camshafts. We get up to a peak of seven pounds out here at 8,000 RPM. And it's hard to tell, well, is this good, bad? Well, we don't know. Let's compare it to something else. Let's take a look at, this is the Jackson Racing Supercharger. We'll compare this to the Vortec Supercharger again at seven pounds and these over here in fact i'm going to go ahead and show you uh with my little pencil here these things over here that is just what happens on the chassis dyno when we do d cell so you don't really have to worry about those lines those do lines don't mean anything so we're running on the chassis dyno we d cell it's still logging that so that's all just d cell stuff but this right here this is the jackson racing uh boost curve this right here, that is the Vortec. We're going to go ahead and get rid of these. Get rid of all of our lines. So we have the Vortex, the Vortec um, supercharger. You can see all the way down here about 2100 RPM. All we had was about one pound of boost. So when we nail the throttle at 2000 RPM, we have one pound of boost with the Vortex Supercharger, whereas we had three pounds with the Jackson Racing Supercharger. On the Vortex Supercharger, we didn't have the seven pounds until the very peak engine speed, basically. And the interesting thing is, and we'll see this when we when we compare the blowers or when we compare the power curves offered by the two blowers, that the Vortex started making more power than the Jackson Racing Supercharger before it started making more boost or equaled the boost of the Jackson Racing Supercharger. It shows that the supercharger itself is more efficient. It also had an intercooler. It also had the long runner intake manifold. All those things combined to help the Vortex Supercharger basically make more power. So now let's take a look. We're going to go ahead and We'll get out of this and then we'll go ahead and take a look. Oh, we're going to exit our drawing. We'll go ahead and take a look and overlay the turbo kit now. So this is the turbo kit with seven pounds of boost. And as expected, you can see that the turbo actually, when we nailed the throttle, it had as much boost as the Vortec did. So this thought that, you know, superchargers, particularly centrifugal superchargers, especially at that low of an engine speed, have immediate boost. They really don't. The turbo had almost as much, but neither one of them had anywhere near as much boost as the positive displacement blower. In fact, the turbo lagged behind the Jackson Racing Supercharger all the way up to 37. 700 RPM, then they were pretty comparable. We had a little bit more boost with the turbo. Let's see, we're taking a look at 6.5 versus 7.5. So it had almost a pound more boost. Again, this is as close as we could get. Um, th this was on the wastegate spring with the turbo and then we didn't have another pulley that where we could add like another half a pound or a pound of boost on the jackson racing supercharger our next pulley took us basically to 10 pounds which we ran 10 pounds on all of these combinations but you can see here the boost curves offered by each form of force induction now let's go do a quick overlay on the power curves okay we've taken a look at the uh boost curves of each one of them now let's take a look and kind of compare the power curves offered by each combination I'm going to bring up the NA combination just real quick here. So this is our Jackson Racing Supercharger versus the the NA combination. I'll get rid of our NA combination. And here's the Jackson Racing versus the Vortec Supercharger, both of them at a peak of seven pounds. And we can see, remember the Vortec, when we compared the boost curves, the Vortec didn't make the same boost as the Jackson Racing Supercharger until the very top of the RPM range, till 8,000 RPM. But you can see, as we would expect, the centrifugal supercharger makes less power than the positive displacement blower does, up to about 5,500 RPM. Then the centrifugal makes more. So way before it's making more boost, it's making more power, and again, one of them is intercooled, one of them has probably a more efficient supercharger, one of them has long runner intake manifold. So it has a lot of things that have changed, not just the fact that we had the same amount of boost. But now let's take a look and see what happens when we added our turbo, our turbo at seven pounds. And as we have come to expect, the turbo made less power than the, than the Jackson Racing Supercharger below 3,500 RPM, but then made more power basically all the way through the curve. You can see this is it right here going through. This is the turbo one. If you'd like me to draw a line here, I can. This is the turbo curve right here. The interesting thing is, 
We'll go ahead and get rid of that. The interesting thing is, and I haven't ever seen this, if we look at this line right here, this is the Vortec. <laughs> the Vortec made more peak power than the turbo did, which shouldn't happen. There are a couple of possible reasons. One of them, we know that the Vortec air-to-water intercooler is better than the air-to-air -air intercooler, or at least it makes more power than the air-to-air -air intercooler used on the turbo. And we know that because we replaced the air-to-air -air with all the long tubing because it was a front-mounted deal in front of the radiator. We replaced that and ran the turbo with the Vortec air-to-water intercooler, and it made more power with the Vortec air to water intercooler. So we know that that's more powerful, although the boost did come up a little bit without it, any change in the wastegate. So it was more efficient, probably flowed better, maybe it had better cooling. But I took a look at the boost was basically the same on these two, despite the fact that the Vortec made more and the air fuel was the same. The thing that I don't know, I thought we were very, very diligent about making sure that the timing was exactly the same on all of these. And I thought that we'd get a pretty good idea. It would be nice to go back and look and data log it. Unfortunately, this test was run decades ago and I don't have access to any of that information. I have never seen a supercharger centrifugal or otherwise make more power than a turbo at the same boost level because you always have the power losses associated with driving the supercharger which the turbo does not have this is what happened let me know in the comments what you guys think but this is an interesting comparison the different forms of forced induction and how they go about doing their things and supplying boost in different manners i'm richard Earl, please make sure like share subscribe ring the bell do all this stuff and i'll keep testing